The Law of the Heart, Matthew 5, verses 33 to 48. Well, brethren and sisters, we continue this evening, of course, in this marvellous section in Matthew chapter 5, the law of the heart. That is, how we should really interpret Yahweh's law, not according as we read it, but according, brethren and sisters, as Yahweh originally intended. And that's the whole point of this section. All the way through here, it's not a question of the Lord Jesus Christ saying, the law said this, but I say that. It's a question of him saying, you thought the law said that, but I'm telling you this. And it's the Lord Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters, who was, of course, fully equipped to interpret that law for us, being truly the son of his father, and therefore understanding the intent that his father had in that law, where, of course, the Jews did not have that in, did not understand that intent. They had come along with their traditions, which had nullified that law. But the Lord Jesus Christ was to give it its true meaning, and this evening we continue from verse 33 to interpret this section in that light. Now they had said, he says, You have heard that it has been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thy oaths. Now the word forswear means to swear falsely. Thou shalt not swear falsely, but thou shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. Now there's a lot contained in that, brethren and sisters. A very great lot indeed. Now, basically, this section is about this matter. What had happened here was this. The law of Moses clearly taught that anyone taking an oath had to do so in Yahweh's name. Now, I'd like you to have a look at that because it's important. In the sixth chapter of Deuteronomy, we have that. Now, in the sixth chapter of Deuteronomy, there was no other way that they could swear but this way. Jeremy chapter 6 and verse 13, Thou shalt fear Yahweh thy Elohim, and serve him, and shall swear by his name. Now again in chapter 10, brethren and sisters, and in verse 20, we have the same thing. It's again repeated here by Moses. The 10th chapter of Deuteronomy, and at verse 20. Thou shalt fear Yahweh thy God, him thou shalt serve, and, and to him thou shalt cleave, and swear by his name. Now that's what the Lord meant when he says, they were to perform unto the Lord their oaths. It wasn't just a question, brethren and sisters, of performing an oath. It was a question of performing it unto the Lord. And there was more in that than just simply saying, that what we do in relation to our oaths is we do them to the Lord. There's more in it than that, you see, because the very point that the Lord is making is this, that when a man swore by the name of Yahweh, it wasn't simply that he was performing that oath before his God, but on behalf of his God. And therefore, to break one's oath, either by intention or by... The, 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 anything that may come along where we cannot control, to break an oath in any way is to deny, brethren and sisters, to deny the existence of the one true God. Now that was the implication of that matter. It was the implication of that matter. And so when they swore by the name of Yahweh to deny that and to break that oath was to deny the very existence of that God. Now that's a serious matter. Now we know that's true. Because when you look at the positive side of it, you look at it in this respect, that when Yahweh swore by himself, brethren and sisters, he always swore concerning eternal matters because he has power to control matters of eternity. And so, for example, when God swore in the promises made to Abraham, Paul says, because it is swear by no greater, he swore by himself that by two immutable things, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of a hope that is set before us. Two immutable things. One, his promise, and two, his existence. Because he swore by himself. That was the promises made to Abraham. And because, because the promises made to Abraham, brethren and sisters, are related to eternal matters, God could swear by his own name. He never, ever swore by that name in relation to matters that were not eternal. Because he is eternal. And to do less than that would be to deny himself. 
And so we read concerning the promises to David that Peter said on the, in the second chapter of Acts that he being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins he would raise up Christ to sit upon his throne. And because it's true that God would raise up Christ to sit upon his throne and that he would sit there forever, God swore by himself. Because that related to matters eternal. As truly as I live, the whole earth will be filled with God's glory forever. And so he swore by himself. He said in another place, concerning the disobedient generation in the wilderness, as truly as I live, your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness. They would die forever. And because God is in control of the destiny of men and nations forever, he can swear by himself. Brethren and sisters, there are no oaths under the law of Moses. There are no divine oaths in relation to the law of Moses because it was never intended to be forever. There are none. No such oaths in relation to the law. Not even into the making of their priesthood. Because God never intended that that law should last forever. It was a schoolmaster to bring them to a certain point in history. It had a, it had a, a purpose. And when that purpose was fulfilled, it was taken out of the way. And therefore there are no divine oaths under the law of Moses. But there were provision for man to make them. But nonetheless, when he made them, he, he could never make them except he attached that to the name of Yahweh because he had to endorse that Yahweh was the one true God and that his intentions were based upon that fact. And therefore, when he swore himself and invoked the divine name, brothers and sisters, there was an enormous obligation to him to keep that. Now in Leviticus 19, we read about that. In Leviticus 19... We read in verse 12. And this really is the quotation that our Lord is quoting in Matthew chapter 5. You'll recognize it. You shall not swear by my name falsely. Neither shall thou profane the name of thy God. I am Yahweh. That's what's at risk. Yahweh's not at risk, brethren and sisters. No one puts him at risk personally. What's at risk is their belief in their God. That's what's at risk. And when a man does not practice what he preaches, he really has demonstrated he doesn't really believe it. And when they invoke the name of Yahweh and fail to live up to those oaths, then they had put at risk their own belief in God. Don't swear falsely by my name. Don't profane that name, for I am Yahweh. God's existence is absolutely true. I am Yahweh. Be careful when you attach your strength of purpose to that name. That's what he's saying. Be careful when you append your strength of purpose to that name. Because that name only relates to eternity and you are not related to eternity. Beware. And consequently the law of Moses, though it of course it called upon men to swear by his name, brethren and sisters, it also exhorted them to be extremely careful about that. And when the law had run its course, men had learnt, they ought to have learnt not to do that. Because circumstances would always arise over which they had no control whatever. Now the Jews did learn that. In measure. And that's what brought about this section in Matthew. They learnt by their experience that when men did swear by the name of Yahweh and they found they couldn't keep it, they were greatly embarrassed. And so they devised in their Jewish interpretations means whereby they could swear by lesser things. Lesser things. Which didn't devolve upon them a, greater, a great responsibility at all to keep it. So they were trying to escape their responsibilities. And so they would swear by heaven. They would swear by the earth. They would swear by the city of Jerusalem. And if a man wasn't too sure, he'd swear by the hair of his head. And so they felt that by those means they could escape the obligation and the responsibility for speaking up and swearing to do certain things or not to do certain things. And what the Lord Jesus Christ does in this section, brethren and sisters, is to tell them, interpreting the law according to the way that God had designed it, it would be better to swear not at all. 
Now he wasn't saying that the law said swear by my name, but I say don't do it. What he was trying to show them was that the law was a schoolmaster. It was there to show men that they could not match the purpose of human hearts with divinity. And if I append my determination to do something to God's holy name, it's a mixed match. And inevitably, there will become failure on my part and I will bring that name into disrepute and disgrace, brethren and sisters. Not because I wasn't allowed to do that, but because I did it foolishly without due regard for my inability and weakness to perform. And when the law had been learnt and understood, by the time they came to the end of it, they ought to have learnt to swear not at all. You're upon earth, says the the wise man. God is in heaven. Let your words be few. We might read that reference, brethren and sisters, in Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Because this captures the spirit of this section. This captures the whole spirit of it. And so the wise man says in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God, and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, and thou upon earth, therefore let thy words be few. Verse 4, When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools, Pay that which thou hast vowed. And so there was the exhortation, brethren and sisters. When you go to the house of God, step carefully. Keep your foot. Don't rush in. Walk slowly and think about what you're doing. And as you think about what you're doing, give priority to listening rather than speaking. Always a wise practice when you're in doubt. Keep your mouth shut and listen. You might learn what not to say or what to say. Don't rush in. And that is very true when it comes to the to the things of God. And don't be rash with your mouth. Or hasty with your heart, says the wise man. And if you do vow, don't defer to pay it. Don't be an idiot. Go on with the matter. Because in verse um, 5 and 6 we read, Better is it that thou shouldest not vow, than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin, neither say before the angel that it was an error. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thine hands? Now notice that terminology, brethren and sisters. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. Swear not at all was the advice of the Lord. Now the the wise man Solomon said it would be better to do it that way. Jesus took it one step further and says, don't do it at all. Why would he do that? Because of the next verse. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin. And that's what happens. We open our mouth and our body can't perform. Now when the wise man Solomon got to the point in his life said it was Better not to do it. Jesus went one step further and said, don't do it. Why, brethren and sisters? But because he was a mature man and had come to realize the weakness of flesh, to fully appreciate exactly what flesh was all about. It profits nothing. Therefore, don't try and match your ability with your mouth. Because somewhere along the line, the flesh will let you down. And your mouth has allied your flesh with God's holy name. Don't do it. Now, that was the exhortation of the wise man. Now, there were other reasons why men might invoke a divine oath. For example, in James chapter 5, here's a different set of circumstances. We may deliberately choose, if we were a Jew, that is, under the law, to invoke an oath under the divine name. Or we may do it in another way, as James says here. It may come as a result of some emotional spontaneity, almost beyond our control. I say almost. And so we find the the James, the 
the, the writer here, telling us what Jesus said, but for a different reason. So in James chapter 5, he says in verse 12, But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea, and your nay nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. Now the context of this chapter, brethren and sisters, is of people either emotionally disturbed because there's been some sickness or some depression or some tragedy, or else emotionally stirred because of some ecstasy of joy over some matter. Now the Jews being very volatile and and demonstrative people were very often left flying with voluble oaths under being excited under certain circumstances that let fly with all sorts of oaths. There were people like that. So whether we deliberately and calmly choose to bow and to swear by Yahweh's name or whether we are excitably led that way, beware. Now the answer, if we're excited in that manner, is in this verse, in the next verse. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing. God doesn't ask us to repress our feelings altogether because that's all sometimes impossible to do. If we're afflicted, if we can't help our feelings, don't be given over to voluble oaths. Pray about it. If we're excited and we want to express our ways to God that we will try and, and, and to live a life that is acceptable to him, don't vow about it. Sing psalms. There's always an outlet, brethren and sisters. That's the point that James is making. So it's a different set of circumstances than Matthew 5, though the words are identical. In James 5, it's a question of the, of the emotive aspects causing that spontaneity which called forth those oaths. But in Matthew 5, there is the deliberate choice of men to swear by certain things because they want to do that in a deliberate and a calculated way. Whichever way it goes, don't do it, is the exhortation both of the Lord Jesus Christ and of James. Now, they might have thought, well, why can't I swear by heaven or by earth? or by Jerusalem, or by my own head, that's not invoking the divine name. But Jesus said it is. Now when you come back to Matthew 5, brethren and sisters, you can't escape any responsibility when you take an oath. You just can't. Now they swore by heaven or by earth. So we read in Matthew 5, verse 34 and 35, But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven. Why? It's God's throne. Don't swear by the earth. Why? Because it's his footstool. Let's consider that. You see what he's saying? You can't miss out on the obligation. If you swear by heaven, it's connected with God. And whether you thought that you had escaped your responsibility or not, you haven't because it's God's throne. Well, we come down, right down to the earth, and we swear by the earth. Surely that's unrelated to God, is it? The scripture says in about five or six places, it's his footstool. He's got his feet on it. He's connected with it. There's a connection between heaven and earth. God owns the world. He owns the universe. There is no escaping that responsibility. Whatever we swear by, says the Lord Jesus Christ, in some way, directly or indirectly, we are allied, of course, to the God that we serve, who owns everything. And we've got to give credence to that view because we believe that. We believe it. And because we believe that heaven's his throne and earth is his footstool, we cannot swear by either of them, because immediately we do, we are swearing by his name. Now the interesting thing, however, is that that's a quotation from Isaiah 66. And much of the discourse on the mount is taken from this section. Now look at the context here, brothers and sisters. It's interesting to see some of these contexts where these words are taken from. In Isaiah 66, verses 1 and 2, Thus saith Yahweh, The heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Now there's the point that the Lord was making. Where is the house that ye will build unto me, and where is the place of my rest? For all those things hath mine hand made, and all those things have been, saith Yahweh. But to this man will I look, even to him that is of a poor and a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. Now you take those Jewish hypocrites, 
trying to escape responsibility to God, and yet, brethren and sisters, trying to impress others with their determined will to do what God has is, is said they ought to do. So as to exude the, 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 the ego that they have, that they themselves can perform wonders, swear by heaven and earth. Jesus says you can't do that because Isaiah 66 says that heaven's his throne, earth his footstool, and God is far more impressed with people who know that I've made everything and who approach me with a contrite spirit, trembling at my word, not theirs. Instead of marching in, being hasty, as, the, as Ecclesiastes said, without due regard, and saying in front of everybody, I swear by heaven I will do so and so. Never mind about that, says the Lord Jesus Christ. You've just attached yourself to divinity. That's your responsibility to keep it. Come what may, whether you think it or not, Far better in coming to there and be impressed with what God tells you and not what you're going to tell anybody. And you know, brethren and sisters, on two occasions that we know of, notable occasions, it is God himself that swore by heaven. In the 12th chapter of Daniel, you remember that God, through the angels, said to Daniel that he lifted up his hands unto heaven and he swore that there'd be a time, times and dividing of time. And in Revelation 10, which quotes that section, the angel lifted up his right hand to heaven and he swore that time would be no longer. And God has been able, brothers and sisters, to regulate time, time, times and a half. He's been able to bridge the gap of history and to regulate that from the hour to the hour exactly, though we may know, not always know that. He has done it exactly because he is Yahweh and he is in heaven and he swears by heaven and he's the same God that will say, Time will be no longer, and he'll swear by heaven, and he'll be able to bring time, as far as Gentilism is concerned, to be no longer. But when mortal man stands there and says the same thing and swears by the same heaven that his God swear by, he puts himself on an equality with his God. Can you determine tonight, brothers and sisters, how long it will be before Russia will fall upon the mountains of Israel? Would you be able to direct the human affairs to bring an end to the papacy right on the very hour of the prophecies of Daniel? Would you be able to do that? No, well, I wouldn't. And so we'd best to keep our mouth quiet and tremble at God's word and never mind about letting people hear what we're going to do. That's the point that the Lord is making. Now you take the city of Jerusalem. Don't swear by that, says the Lord Jesus Christ, because it's the city of the great king. That's Psalm 48. What's his point? Here's the context of this quotation. And I believe our Lord Jesus Christ would expect his, his listeners to think about these things. We read of, of this uh, city of the great king in Psalm 48, verse 2. Beautiful for situation. In the Hebrew, elevation. Beautiful for elevation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the side of the north, the city of the great king. Now the Lord's making two points about that. One is that when you swear by Jerusalem, you still can't escape your responsibilities to God because it's his city. He is indirectly, or directly we may say, connected with that city. You can't get away with it. But when you look at the context in which it's found, you read about Jerusalem being beautiful for elevation on the sides of the north. Now, if you look at that Bible there, that's about as near as I could get to level. But Jerusalem's not level. It's like that. It's tilted like that. It's on the slope of the hill like that. That's north. That's east. This is west and that's south. And you can approach Jerusalem from the south and you can see it. From the east you can see it. And from the west you can see it. You can't see it from the north. So when they invoked the divine oath in the name of the city of Jerusalem... And Jesus took them to that reference. Any man who swears by the city of Jerusalem has got to be able to do that. That's what he's got to be able to do. And the Lord directed him to that reference. What he was trying to tell him is that you're going to swear by a city, brethren and sisters, that one day will be different. Where is your oath then? Where's our oath if the thing changes? God's going to make that city different. He's going to lift it right up in the air. 
so that it can be seen on every side, including from the north, where they can't see it. So when we turn to the city and we say, we swear by this great city of Jerusalem, come the age to come, we look at it, it's gone, it's different, it's not there. Where's our arrows? Not worth a crack. Nor have we the power to change that city. That's the point the Lord is making. Psalm 48, brothers and sisters, is dealing with dramatic changes which we cannot affect. They'll be affected by the feet of the Son of God when his feet shall touch the Mount of Olives, his footstool. When it stands on the earth, dramatic changes will take place. Not because we have vowed, but because he has declared. It's the point the Lord is making. All right, they got down to the hairs of their head. That may take some people a bit longer or a bit shorter according to your age, I suppose. But even whatever, brethren and sisters, no man, of course, can control the hairs of his head. God says, through his son, in the 10th chapter of Matthew, in verse 30, when the Lord was speaking to his disciples about the care that their heavenly Father has for them, he says, even the very hairs of your head are numbered. Even the hairs of your head were numbered. And brethren and sisters, if we were even in that respect, if we even in that respect try to match God, we'd have to count every day, wouldn't we? Because even that changes. And the colour of your hair. Who's got control over that? Oh, we've got some artificial means, but they don't mean a thing. Jesus is not talking about artificial means. He's talking about the natural processes of life. Who's got control? over the colour of their hair, whether it be white or black. And you know, brethren and sisters, generally speaking, what the Lord is trying to say is this, that who's got control over the full body of their hair to keep it sheen or otherwise? And of course, you know what happens? Inevitably, we get older and the colour of that hair changes. And there's no way known that we can stop it. And yet men swear by it. They feel, well, I'm swearing by something less than myself, perhaps. They might feel they're right down to rock bottom. Surely now I escape all my responsibility to God. No, we can't, because God controls our destiny. It is a divine law, an inexorable law, that takes us from the cradle to the grave, and in that process, the head of our hair changes. We don't change it, that law does. You know, there's a dramatic reminder of it to Israel of that in Hosea's prophecy. How could they swear by the hair of their head when you consider this prophecy, brethren and sisters? In the seventh chapter of Hosea's prophecy, concerning the people of Israel, God said in the ninth verse, Strangers have devoured his strength, and he knoweth it not. Yea, grey hairs are here and there upon him, yet he knoweth it not. And you can rest assured, brethren and sisters, that as we grow older, especially as we go through the stages of youth through to being young men or young ladies and on, you can rest assured that the first grey hair you find is not the first. Here or there they would have been before, but you didn't see it. Until one day, one of them caught your attention. But there have been others before that one. Here and there, and you wouldn't have seen them. And there was Israel, self-confident, unaware that strangers were among them and weakening their strength and that grey hairs were appearing, getting older, and they didn't know it. Yet men foolishly, thinking to escape responsibility to God, swear by their head or the hairs of their head. What an incredible folly that is. So the Lord's teaching is dramatic, brothers and sisters. And in the end, they would have learned that whatever the law may have said, it was trying to teach them that flesh is weak. And therefore, when the Lord allowed, uh, when the law allowed them to make oaths in the divine name, it was to teach them that their flesh, or rather their mouth, was causing their flesh to sin. When they come to realize that, swear not at all, was the instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let your yea be yea, and your nay, nay. Now, I don't believe the Lord was saying that when we say yes, we say it twice, or we say no, we say it twice. Although he had a habit himself of saying verily, verily, truly, truly, to emphasize the truth of his teaching. But that's a different thing. Here it's our word, either yes or no. Can't we say yes or no? Why can't we say yes or no? 
What's the problem? You know, brethren and sisters, when a man or a woman has had to recourse to, to uh, has recourse to an oath, it infers a doubt, isn't it? If we can't simply say yes or no without invoking some oath to that, well then there's some doubt about it. And the very way we try to emphasise a thing to be right or wrong is in itself emphasising a doubt we have about it. Why can't our word be yes or no? Why must we add things to it? It's because I say, we've got to emphasise something because we feel there's a doubt. Although we don't, by our very expression, we don't exude that. But that's the point. And you know, an oath weakens the point of truth rather than confirms it. So James says, let your yea be yea. And that's what Jesus meant when he said, let your yea be yea. Let it be one thing, not two things. You know, brethren, says that's the best way, isn't it? And then we're not invoking a divine oath. We're not attaching a human, a human willpower to the divine essence. We're not saying that we can do what God can do. We're merely saying what we are as men and women in all honesty, yes or no. Now you take the Apostle Paul in the Second Corinthians chapter one. He was in a situation like this. He was a man of his word, but he couldn't keep his word. Circumstances were out of his control. It wasn't that he didn't mean to keep it, but he couldn't. So he had this to say in the second Corinthians chapter one. In verse 15. And in this confidence I was minded to come unto you before that ye might have a second benefit, and to pass by you into Macedonia, and to come again out of Macedonia unto you, and of you to be brought on my way towards Judea. And that was his plans. But it it got mixed up. He, he couldn't fulfil that. Circumstances were against it. He says in verse 17, When I therefore was thus minded, did I use lightness? Or the things that I purpose, do I purpose according to the flesh, that with me there should be yea, yea, and nay, nay? In other words, Paul says, do I deliberately tell you I'm going to do a thing and then knowing I'm not going to do it? Is that what I do? If circumstances are such are out of my control that I can't keep my word, as I would have liked to have done, did I do it lightly, knowing I couldn't do it? No, of course he didn't. He was genuine about that. But he was human. And that's the point. And you know, brethren and sisters, there would be nobody in this hall that I would know of, and I don't know your personal life, there would be nobody in this hall that suffers more than me over that matter. I am forever saying I'm going to do things, and I cannot do them. And I suffer over that exceedingly to a point that I get where I think I will do no more work in the truth because I continually have to change it. And I don't go and I don't say lightly I'll do this or do that. I mean it. I want to do it. I've got a will to do it. And time and again I haven't been able to do that until I sicken myself of it and think, well, I won't do a thing. I won't do anything. That's not right either. That's how it gets you. But you don't do it lightly. And it really upsets one when you can't fulfil what you'd like to fulfil. This we know, brethren and sisters, that whatever we may fail in as human beings, we don't do it because we we use lightness. We're genuine in what we say. But we're not always able to do it. But God is. Verse 18. But as God is true, our word towards you was not yea and nay. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me and Silvanus and Timotheus, was not yea and nay, but in him was yea. For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him are men, under the glory of God by us. In other words, said the Apostle, that whatever circumstances made it impossible for my human plans to be uh, carried out, God's plans remain the same. And whilst I may fail you because I can't manipulate circumstances, the things that I tell you will never fail. And therefore, because I preach this, I have to be genuine in what I say too. And if I can't keep it, it's only because I'm not God. But he preached the promises of God, to which in Jesus Christ are yes. There's no if, buts or maybes about that promise, brethren and sisters. He died and he rose again. The promises are sealed in that fact. They are yes to the glory of God. And he is, in Paul's terminology, the God of our men. 
the God of our men. And so what does Isaiah the prophet say in his 65th chapter concerning this matter of swearing? Isaiah 65 and verse 16, that he who blesses himself in the earth shall bless himself in the God of our men. And he that sweareth in the earth shall swear by the God of our men. That's the Hebrew word. Because the former troubles are forgotten and because they are hid from mine eyes. And what all that verse is saying in, in modern parlance is this. That the day is going to come when the servants of God, the true servants of God, would have no confidence in self. None whatever. If they want a blessing, they put their confidence in the God of our men. If they want to be certain of the future, then they'll put their confidence in the God of our men. So be it. They'll have no confidence in themselves. And the former troubles are forgotten. Hid from their eyes. Just as Paul's troubles were. And Paul had to get to a stage where he had to say to himself, I cannot now worry about the plans that have all been frustrated because I'm human. I've got to put my trust in God who says, Amen. Never mind about how I went wrong. That's human beings. But my trust is in God. And in him, all the promises are yes. No if, buts or maybes with God. And if God can say yes or no, why can't we? That's the point that the Lord Jesus Christ is making, and that's the point that the Apostle Paul is making. And says the Lord, any more, of, any more than that cometh of evil. As soon as we bring in an oath alongside of our word, it's evil because we really have to reinforce our own word. And when we're going to reinforce our own word, by inference, we're saying that it's weak and it's doubtful. It cometh of evil. Now coming back to Matthew chapter 5, on to the next matter of the heart, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Verse 38. You have heard that it's been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now you see, that was a Jewish interpretation. You might say, hang on, but that's exactly what the law of Moses said. It did. But you see, that's just a Jewish interpretation. They're not saying what's in the context. And you know, brethren and sisters, what's in the context and what they're saying is, is as much alike as North and South Pole. Because taken in isolation, and this is the point, I want you to listen carefully because this is the subtle difference, and it's not so subtle either. Taken in isolation, taken in isolation, the expression, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, is to preach the doctrine of retaliation. You poke my eye out and I'll poke your eye out. You knock my tooth out and I'll knock your tooth out. And that's what they thought the law of Moses was saying. Now I don't want to turn up all the chapters where that is found. But just explain to you and you'll see how different the law was than that. Because the expression, brethren and sisters, was not setting forth the law of retaliation. But the law of equitable justice. There is a difference. And what the law was saying is this. That justice must be equal. It must be no less than an eye for an eye. Otherwise it's complicity with evil. No more than a tooth for a tooth. Unless a further evil is created. In other words, it wasn't literally an eye for an eye. A tooth for a tooth. What God was saying, that justice must be equal and fair. And in the chapter where that is found, in the 21st chapter of Exodus, brothers and sisters, it's dealing with compensation, not retaliation. A man or a woman was compensated for loss. They did not get their enemy to suffer exactly as they suffered. That's not what happened. The Jews were wrong about that. The law was not teaching retaliation. It was teaching compensation. And when you look at the law of Exodus 21, you can do that in the leisure of your home, in the privacy of your home. You look at that, you'll see that they didn't say to their enemy, because he did this, I'll do that to him. It didn't say that. It said certain things happened, certain people suffered loss because 
of somebody else's uh, foolishness or inattention or, or whatever, and that person had to make compensation. And the compensation was not always equal. It was not the law of retaliation at all. The Jews had completely misinterpreted that. Furthermore, when you look at Exodus 21, where the, one of those expressions is found, you see in verse 22 it says that the man will pay whatever the judges determine. Whatever the judges determine. Now, brethren and sisters, if it was an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, no one would have to determine anything. There would be retaliation. And that, re- that answers itself. We would know what to do by what happened. But it didn't happen like that. The judges were to determine what a man was to pay by way of compensation. Which again proved it wasn't the law of retaliation at all. And it also proved this. That all such matters, eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, were determined by the panel of the judges. It was not left up to a personal application of retaliation against your enemy. The law did not say, he did that to you, you go and do that to him. It never said that. It never gave you any right whatever to do that. But you, as much as him, had to do exactly what the judges determined. And so you can see what's going to happen. Paul may knock my eye out or something. Instinctively, following my human instincts, I'm going to knock his eye out. That's, that was how the Jews understood eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But the law of Moses said, he's knocked your eye out, he must pay compensation. And that won't be left up to me to say what he paid. Pay. Because I'm a bit upset about it. I'm a bit wild. I'm a bit irrational. I'm likely to say stupid things. I'm going to be a bit vindictive. It's not left up to me. I've got to go to the judges and they will determine. Paul has to agree what the judges say. I have to agree what the judges say. And we've got to accept their decision. That is not retaliation between brother and brother as the Jews interpreted that brethren and sisters. Now that's what the Lord was teaching them first of all. So it was wrong to think that it was the law of retaliation. It was not. It was the law of compensation. Ah, but now comes the issue. Come back to Matthew 5. Now we come, brethren and sisters, to the the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ, which again interpret the spirit of the law. And what was the spirit of the law? The spirit of the law was that we don't even worry about compensation. Now you think about that. Look, resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. If any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, give him your cloak. If they want to go with a mile, go too. And you see what the Lord is saying. Let's take it stage by stage. And perhaps I could have had this on a transparency for you. Jewish interpretation was, eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. The law of retaliation, wrong. The law of Moses was the law of compensation determined by a panel of judges, not left up to the upsets between individuals. The law of the Lord Jesus Christ, as God intended it was, that a man should suffer wrong and try and overcome the evil by not only refusing compensation, but voluntarily offering, brethren and sisters, equal compensation For the wrong done. Now look how that soars above human thinking. So instead of accepting compensation, we are prepared to voluntarily give further and to be wronged if need be, in order that we may overcome the evil of the person so worrying us. That soars above human interpretation. And when you think about it, it really hurts really down deep because we don't practice that. I was casting about in my mind when I left home on some matter I could raise that would illustrate that. Very difficult, perhaps, to take an illustration that would help us in our 20th century. But it came to my mind that we had a discussion among several brethren, and this has happened more than once, about this camp we're going to buy. This was not a plug for the camp. Nothing to do with that. I'm dealing with a principle. I'm not so mercenary to introduce that matter in this way. It's got to do with principle. 
One of the objections is that if we procure this place and it's shared between all the suburban ecclesias, when it comes to ecclesial weekends, oh, how do we know we're going to get it on the weekend when we want it? Now you think about that. You think of how diabolical we really are in our hearts. When we can't even practice the law of Matthew 5 among our friends, let alone our enemies, that's appalling if we couldn't get to a point where we say, you go first, or I'll go eight. We know nothing about the Sermon on the Mount. We've never learned a thing about it. When we can't practice that amongst ourselves, how on earth are we going to apply that principle to our enemy? No way could we apply it. It's unbelievable. We don't know anything about his teaching, do we? We're going to get behind this record, brethren and sisters. Not retaliation. Yes, the law of compensation, but not for you or me. We're the one paying compensation for the wrong done to us. Goodness. How far that falls above every human consideration. It would have left them standing there aghast at that teaching, brethren and sisters. And you might say, well, that's unfair. That's not even being fair. Yes, it is, you see. Because what you're trying to do is to not simply take compensation so that you can be then compensated and he's got, he's been, he's had a, been fined for his evil. You leave him an evil person. That doesn't help him. It helps you. It doesn't help him. But when you stick that right cheek, that, 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 you, you hit on the, on, on the, the right cheek and you turn the other one, that shames him, brothers. That might change the person. Won't help you in the physical sense. But it might help him in the spiritual sense. That's what the law of Moses was all about. And that was the spirit of the law. You take what the Proverbs said. We've been reading the Proverbs. These are wonderful teachings. The proverb says, in the 20th Proverb, in verse 22, Say not thou, I will recompense evil, but wait on Yahweh, and he will save that. You think about that. Don't try and redress any evil against yourself. Don't try and do that. Pause and consider and wait on Yahweh. Now you just take the 24th chapter of Proverbs. You see, the Jews were wrong about the law of retaliation. The Lord was not, the law was not teaching that. And here's the witness of that, because here is the Proverbs, and all the Old Testament was law. Proverbs 24, 29 says, Say not, I will do so to him as he has done to me. I will render to man according to his work. Don't say that. In other words, don't say the way the Jews said it, eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. I will do so to him as he has done so to me. Don't say that. But do unto men as, they, as you would have them do unto you. That's the reverse, brothers and sisters. That's the reverse of that principle. And so that's what the Lord Jesus Christ was trying to impress them with. Now he says, if a man smite you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Now do you ever consider why he says the right cheek? What difference would it make? Well, it does make a difference. You were standing opposite me, and you hit me on the right cheek, you'd have to use the back of your hand. Wouldn't you? If you didn't, you hit me on the left cheek. And you see, that was a, a term of insult. When a man hits you like that, he, he's just angry. But when a man hits you like that, it's contemptuous. he just smack you across the oh, I hit you across the and your head would snap back like that. He's insulted you. Now, everyone that gets insulted by that, brothers and sisters, it would be almost impossible to quell that spirit of retaliation. It would be so instinctive. It's hard enough to be punched in the jaw. Perhaps you might reel back at admiring him for a good right arm. But when he does this sort of thing, oh, it's just contemptuous. And you just, oh, you, you, your body just responds like an electric flash. Now that's got to be resistant. i tell you what the Lord does not mean. 
He doesn't mean to turn around and put the other cheek like that, and then the other cheek like that. Then the other. He's not saying that. That's just Billy being making yourself a martyr. You know why he's not saying that? Because he didn't do that himself. Nor did the Apostle Paul. Both the Lord and the Apostle Paul were hit upon the cheek. Literally. Neither one of them offered the other. Not literally they didn't, but spiritually they did. They weren't just silly enough to make themselves martyrs for martyrs' sake. What that's saying is that we should resist the temptation to retaliate. And Jesus did, and Paul did. In the first of Peter, chapter 2, we resist the impulse to retaliate. In the first of Peter, chapter 2, here is the principle, brethren and sisters, reading from verse 21, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Isn't that what the proverb says? You don't recompense evil, you put your trust in Yahweh. Well, that's exactly what he did. Now, Peter doesn't say that when he was smitten, he turned the other cheek, and when he was smitten on that cheek, he turned back again. He doesn't say that, but that's the principle of it. The principle of it, when he was reviled, he didn't revile again. He resisted that temptation. When he suffered, he didn't threaten anybody. He took it calmly. And he put his trust in God that finally, in the court of appeal of heaven, he would be vindicated. That's what he did. So the, the principle's not meant to be taken literally, brethren and sisters, but to resist the impulse. You see, if I got hit on the right cheek and then sort of arrogantly stuck the other cheek around, I'm not resisting the impulse to retaliate. I'm trying to shame my brother by showing him I take it literally. And in that, I'm as bad as he is. You're not resisting anything. Your feelings are being expressed by turning the other cheek. Literally, if you do it that way. But if you suppress your feelings and look at him dispassionately, with sad eyes to think that's the sad thing that happened for his sake, that he's the one that suffered, that's a different thing. And you really mean that. Then that's what the Sermon on the Mount is talking about. It's really talking about that. You feel sorry for him. See, chapter 3 and verse 9 of the first of Peter, we're just in that section, where Peter says in chapter 3, not rendering evil, or verse 9 of chapter 3, not rendering evil for evil, or railing for railing, but contrarywise, blessing. Knowing that ye are there unto call, that ye should inherit a blessing. Now once again, brethren and sisters, Peter wouldn't have you to be so egotistical that when a person curses you, and so on, you turn and say, I bless you, I bless you. He's not saying that. He's not mean to do it literally. But you, in the sense that you want that person to be different, that you're sad that that person's like that. You really would like them to change. So they're only hurting themselves, not you. And kindly put that matter before them and show them that you're above human feeling and you might change that person. That's the issue. It's a very difficult thing he's talking about, isn't it? If they sue thee at the law, he says, they want to take your coat, give them the cloak also. Didn't he do that, brother and sister? I mean, he had power. Even though he was nailed to the cross, would I not ask of my father twelve leads of evasion and would he not give them? And the question is, wouldn't he? Would you dare to say, knowing the principles of the atonement as we do, would you dare to say, brethren and sisters, that the Son of God asked twelve legions of angels that his father wouldn't have given them to him? He said, would I not ask? Would he not give them? Would you go to him and say, no? I wouldn't. And so the Lord had that power, if he wanted it. He could have rescued his coat, demanded it back. But he let his cloak and his coat go, didn't he? They gambled for it. So he showed a supreme example in that. And you know, then it says, they want to compel you to go mild, go two. Now that's a reference to a custom which was practiced, brethren and sisters, in those days by a conquering army. Actually, the Greek word means to be a courier. And it's a word which became applied to a practice whereby a conquering army would impress someone into public service by using themselves or their goods so that the Romans could come along to a Jew and say, hey, I want that farm, I want that ox, I want that cart, I want this. Come on, hurry up, I want them now. That was the, the idea behind that word. 
and how galling that would be to the Jews, brethren and sisters, that for the Roman overlord to come along and say, in the name of Caesar, I want to use that, never mind it being yours, it's, it's mine today, I want that use of that. You would go to him and say, look, anything else you'd like? Anything else you'd like? The Roman. You know, we've got an example of that in the scripture, where that law was actually put into practice. There was a man coming out of the country, going into the city of Jerusalem. He was a visitor of the city from Cyprus. He was Simon the Cyrene. And as he passed the cavalcade of the cross going to Golgotha, the Romans grabbed him and put him into public service. They applied that law. And there never was a man who walked a better mile than that. Whatever his attitude may have been, he was pressed into service. And one can just perhaps imagine, we don't know what happened, but perhaps as that man went along behind the other man, or alongside of him even, his heart and mind would have changed as he beheld the wonder of that man and saw the spirit of him. And it could well have been, brethren and sisters, it would have been the best mile that he ever walked. And if he had to go further, he probably would have gone. That's the spirit of the truth, isn't it? That is the real spirit of the truth. We're going to be subject to higher powers without bitterness. That's the point. Romans tells us that. Peter tells us that. The apostle in Romans says we're going to be subject to the higher powers. Peter says the same thing. And they tell us we're going to do that without bitterness. We're going to do it because it's right. Because the scripture says it's right. And because under certain circumstances it's right for the, for, for the maintenance of society. We know, of course, the graft, we know the corruption, we know all the evil. That's got nothing to do with it. It's our attitude that counts, brethren and sisters. Never mind what the government does. It's how you view the government. What you do about it is, is the thing that counts. And if you think you can cheat the tax man and he deserves to be cheated, you'll be cheating yourself at the judgment seat. Believe me, you will. Because the Lord Jesus Christ is not going to listen to you complaining about the tax man. He's going to be listening to what's going to happen to your heart. Because he didn't know, it wasn't the tax man that asked you to pay taxes, it was Jesus Christ. That's who it was. And that's all that matters. And that's what our attitude should be to everything in life, brothers and sisters. There's no doubt about that. Until we come to verse 42. And in verse 42... Matthew 5 and verse 42. Give to him that asks of thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn thou not away. Give to him that asks of thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. You know, brethren and sisters, of all the things the Lord said in that section, that's the only thing that we really do without compulsion. Isn't it? When a man smites us on the right cheek, we can't do anything about that. That's his action. If someone wants to sue us at the law, we can't do anything about that either. That's their action. If someone's a, a conquering army is going to compel us to go a, go a mile, we, that's beyond our power to, to, uh, to, uh, to change one way or the other. All we can do in those three former circumstances is to cheerfully submit to the non-resistance of evil. That's all we can do in service to our Lord. But here's something. Coming to the end of that matter, where we have got the power to give or not to give, lend or not to lend. How do we go about that? Lending. How many times have you run across this in your life? Brother buys, well let's say, a caravan. He justifies it on the grounds that, well, it can be good for the Easter camp. I save $100 or so every year and a few years I'll pay for it. About four or five. Or he could say, well, I'll, uh, well, anybody can have it. I'll lend it to the brother and sister. And the day comes. For someone to say, can I have your van? Oh dear, oh dear. Boy, that hurts then, doesn't it? Because you've just done this up, you've just done that up, 
You're very meticulous about that. You've got this sort of crockery in there. You've got it all set up to suit you. And then it really hurts, doesn't it? And all those things that are bought in the truth to lend, when the day of the moment of truth actually comes, how many times, brothers and sisters, are they not for loan? Oh, we get around it. We say, I'd love to lend it to your brother. But you know, I lent it to brother so-and-so and he made a mess of it. And if I lend it to you, I'm going to lend it to anybody. And on that principle, you can't have it. You haven't heard that said? Open your ears. You find how difficult things are to borrow. You don't get them returned. Or whatever the excuse may be, brethren and sisters. They have it under the law of Moses, those sort of excuses. The 15th chapter of Deuteronomy. They're nothing new. People are always full of excuses. 15th chapter of Deuteronomy, verse 7. If there be among you a poor man of one of thy brethren within any of thy gates in thy land, which Yahweh thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not harden thine heart, nor shut thine hand from thy poor brother. But thou shalt open wide, thy hand wide unto him, and shalt surely lend him sufficient for his need in that which he wanted. Beware that there be not a thought in thy wicked heart, saying, The seventh year, the year of release, is at hand, and thine eye be evil against thy poor brother, and thou givest him naught, and he cry unto Yahweh against thee, and it be sin unto thee. Thou shalt surely give him, and thine heart shall not be grieved when thou givest unto him. Because that for this thing Yahweh Elohim shall bless thee in all thy works, and in all that thou puttest thine hand unto. You see the principle, brethren and sisters. There are many principles in that. Some of them are very simple principles. A brother wants something from you, and you're in the land, and the year of release is coming up. And the year of release was when people were released from their debts. And there may only be six months to go, and you know full well... But all he's going to do is hold out the six months that you've lost, that you've loaned him. The law of Moses was his protector. And you think in your heart, I know why he's asked me, because he knows the seventh year has come down. Now you see, the law doesn't simply condemn the mean spirit. You see, there wasn't only, it wasn't the Lord Jesus Christ who, who first framed the law of the heart. It was all enshrined in this law. All the Lord Jesus Christ did was to expound it. He didn't create it. It was all in there. And God is not going to condemn you because you've got a mean spirit merely. He'll condemn you for it, but that's not all he'll condemn you for. Because you simply do not believe in God. That's the crime, brethren and sisters. Because God says, you know that Yahweh thy Elohim shall bless you in all your works. Don't worry about it. You'll be looked after. Now we all find that exceedingly difficult to handle because it's all a question of faith. And there's nothing more difficult to be faithful about than money. Money is very real. It looms very large. It's very substantial. It's solid. We really know a lot about money. And because money looms large in our mind, it crowds out faith. We'll be faithful in almost anything except money. We will not be faithful in the matter of money. It is the root of all evil. It is. The love of it is. The root of all evil. Not money itself, but the love of it. You know, brethren, this is a terrible thing. It's a shocking thing. Oh, but we get around that wonderfully. We say, oh, strike. If you go to everybody that asks you, they'd just filch you. You'd be stung to the bone before you knew where you were. Well, it's true. And the Lord Jesus Christ, brethren and sisters, would not be teaching us to just lend indiscriminately. And that's a very comfortable thought. Woe to the brother that takes that thought of the judgment seat for an excuse for every type of lending. You see, we rationalise it. Every time it's rationalised. I'll guarantee that even after this class, if they come up for discussion, somebody will rationalise it. They'll say, oh, but you couldn't give to everybody that asked you. 
I mean, there are some people who are just so irresponsible. They don't know what to do with their own money. They fling it around like a man with no arms. They, they, they don't know what they're doing with their cash. They're totally irresponsible. I'm not going to lend money to them. Which, in effect, means in their heart, I'm going to lend money to nobody. True it is. But we must not be indiscriminate in that matter. Paul says to the Thessalonians, if a man doesn't work, he don't eat. But brethren and sisters, whilst those principles are true, God won't be deciding at the judgment seat as to whether it was wise or unwise for you to be discreet about lending money. That will not be the issue. The issue will be, beware that there be not a thought in your wicked heart. That will be the issue. Not whether you thought it would be indiscreet to lend that brother money. The issue will be what was in your heart. Very, very difficult. Extremely difficult principles, brethren and sisters. They are difficult principles because they're taught by our Lord Jesus Christ and because they have to do with the law of the heart. Now I'm glad that it's 20 past 9 and we can stop because I've got here the law of the heart in the next session dealing with love. And of course that's going to be the crowning glory of the Lord's teaching in this fifth chapter of Matthew. And it may be as well, brethren and sisters, to come back next time, God willing, consider that on its own because it's a beautiful section because it really is a most wonderful consideration, the law of love. For thou shalt love thy neighbour with all your heart. It's a marvellous law. And with those a few thoughts we've offered tonight about the law, of, the law of the heart in relation to oaths, in relation, of course, to non-resistance, let's think about those things, brethren and sisters, and let's come back next time prepared for the greatest of all those considerations in the, in the, in the matter of the law of the heart.